I want to ask you, how many of you have ever prayed this prayer before? I'm going to put it on the screen. God, grant me the serenity to accept things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. How many of you have ever prayed that prayer ever before? Isn't that an awesome prayer? There's more to this prayer, but that's the part I wanted to kind of focus on today, is grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. How much effort do we put into things that we cannot change? How much, if you think of your brain as a computer, I know some of you guys don't, don't really care for technology and computers and all that kind of stuff, but I live in that world a little bit. And uh, it would, your mind, the, the processing power that your mind has, there's a lot of it that's dominated by things that we cannot change. Isn't there? You think about this, in a lot of different perspectives, and a lot of different things. I think we have all prayed this prayer at certain times. There are things in life we can't change, and that stresses us out. There are things about your job that you cannot change. There are things about your spouse that you cannot change. Right? Nobody's willing to admit that. My wife's going to put her hand up big time back there on that one. Right? Right, honey? She's just giving me a big grin, like, move on. I know, here it comes. <laughs> not fantastic? There are things about your body that you cannot change. Oh, I got amens on that one. <laughs> That's kind of good. All right. There are things about this country you cannot change. And when you cannot control something, how does it make you feel? It makes you feel helpless, doesn't it? Makes you feel out of control. It makes you feel like, can you go back to that first slide? Uh, just, it just makes you, I love this picture. It makes you feel like that. You just want to lay down. She is face up, by the way. She's just laying down. She's got her hair all over her face. And she's just like, I don't want to see the world right now. How many of you do that? Go into your bedroom, close, close the door, turn off all the lights, put the blanket over your head, and just wrap yourself up in a cocoon and just be like, yeah, I don't, I, I'm done being an adult today. Right? Yeah. So, or a kid. You can not be a kid too, but it feels like chaos. When you cannot control things, it feels like chaos. I find it interesting that today, I didn't plan this, that today is the 15th anniversary of 9-11. And, and, and this is what we're talking about. I, I, I would imagine that most of you can remember the place that you were when you found out that the Twin Towers had been hit by an airplane. Uh, not, not my intention to... to, to Talk about age, but I was in the eighth grade. <laughs> I knew I was going to get a response on that one. <laughs> Everybody's like, what? All right. I was in the eighth grade in my algebra class that I was failing at the time. And uh, <laughs> that was the fault of those, those awesome T83, T, what are they called? The, the calculators, graphing calculators? Because we figured out you could put games on them. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing a math problem. Oh, darn it. Uh, yeah, so anyway, um, it was great. So I was in the middle of math class. My math class happened to be, uh, it had to be split by my lunch hour. So we had like, this made no, this is probably why I failed. I'll blame it on the lunch hour. Cause we had, we had like 20 minutes before lunch and then 20 minutes after lunch. And so you get halfway through a problem and you're like, you have to go to lunch and then you got to come back and you're like, uh, I don't know what's going on. But when we got back from lunch, our teacher sat us down and said, this is what's happening. And then, then we went on with the rest of our day. So I came home not realizing it was a big deal. And I'm like, well, there aren't any planes in the sky. And my parents just kind of looked at me like, you realize like this is a big deal. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. So yeah, it wasn't, they didn't make a big deal out of it. North Branch, I had friends at North Branch and they were, they like stopped school for the rest of the day and turned on news. And like now understanding the gravity of the situation, looking back on that, I'm like, man, that kind of stinks that we didn't, I didn't want just a day off, but like I was glued to the television after I figured out what was actually happening. How many of you were in the same boat? Just like so worried about things, right? It was, it was a wild situation. It was, uh, it was behind enemy lines, you know? And that, that really impacted the security that we all felt, we all enjoyed up until that point. And that was, from, from my mind, remember I was in the eighth grade, so I, I, don't, I didn't have a whole lot of percep, pers, uh, perspective on, on life and how things worked at that point. But um, that really, to me, was the beginning of the recession for, for Michigan and for a lot of those things. Because it wasn't too long after that that I got my first job. And, 
And I was working on commission when I started and, and, and doing all that, and it just started kind of declining. I got my commission taken away. I got minimum wage went up, but I didn't get her. <laughs> I lost the only raise I got, <laughs> which was kind of funny. I technically got another raise, but it wasn't, you know, whatever. But so 9-11 really impacted a lot of people, and it really changed the course of a lot of people's lives. It caused a lot of stress in our nation, and it still does to some degree today. Because it's been a problem that hasn't been removed from our minds since that day that it happened. Not only that, but we've got many other things that are now happening. That triggered a lot of people. Um, We have had conspiracy theory after conspiracy theory about what actually happened. We have had... uh, had politicians and we've had uh, news personalities and we've had a lot of people that have just become split and divided down the middle about how we should handle this issue and how we should go about taking care of things. And some say close the border. Some say let's nuke them. Some say we need to talk about this. And, and everybody has a different perspective on what has happened and how it's going to take place. And, and that has affected, especially my generation, uh, as we've grown up and, and as we've realized this new world. There are things that we cannot control. I remember a lot of people being fearful, wanting vengeance, um, just, just stressed out over the state of the country. What are we supposed to do when things are beyond our control? You know? Pray, yeah, absolutely. But, but I, am, I hope that what we, what we see today is that that is definitely an answer. But it's not enough. God will take care of it, but it's not enough. And so I want to I take an example of Abram's life. Now, um, we talked this, about this last week, but Abram is the same guy as Abraham. Remember Father Abraham? The many sons? Many sons of Father Abraham? All right. He is the, the guy that God had made the initial covenant with that would start the line that would bring about Jesus. He, he started the nation of Israel, basically, is what you, what you can look at this as. And God made some promises. We discussed that last week. Um, God actually changes his name in Genesis chapter 17, and you can read about that story and, and what, what the significance of that is. That's not the purpose for our time today. Um, so if I slip up and say Abraham instead of Abram, we're talking about the same guy. It's not a different guy. But last week, we, we saw God give Abram a promise. Um, he began a covenant with Abram. God was going to make his name great. That's what God told him. Uh, God was going to bless him, um, and God was going to bless all who blessed Abram. Uh, and, and he was going to curse all that came against Abram. And so the condition was that, that Abram leave his land. The condition was that Abram leave his family and leave his father's house. And, and it wasn't like in a few years. It was like, you need to get up and you need to start moving now. Uh, we have a teenage boy at home. Um, Kim this week said, you need to go clean your room. And he sat there watching TV. And she said, you need to go take care of your chores okay (laughs) and i just looked at him like are you for real right now you know that doesn't do anything does it sitting there going yeah i know what i need to do but not doing anything about it right doesn't take care of anything and it causes stress in other people's lives doesn't it but god asked abram to go what did abram do he got up and he went and he did it right that is obedience. That is honorable, right? And if your employer were to say, get up and move, you're, what are you going to do? Get up and move. Why? If you want your job, if you want your paycheck, right? There is a blessing to obedience. And that's, that's kind of part of the underline that we were talking about last week is that Abram went, no pausing. He obeyed God and he receives blessing in this. And so Abram and his wife Sarai were traveling along with a few other family members. And so the other one uh, that, that is most prevalent in this that we're going to talk about today is Lot, Abram's nephew. And, and though God's, through God's provision, both Abram and Lot, they ended up becoming rich. They ended up getting a lot of, uh, of, of um, possessions. Uh, Genesis 13 that says that Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and gold. That sounds pretty good to me, right? You get steak and you get cash, right? That Perfect. So you got all that. Lot wasn't too bad off either. The Bible says that he had flocks, herds, and tents. I'm okay without the tents. We can, we can move on with, the, with the, the other stuff, though. They had so much that the land couldn't support them being both together in the same place. That's what the Bible says. They had, they had so many possessions 
that they couldn't be in the same location at the same time. Why do you think that is? Arguments. There were fights between the animals because they were trying to graze in the same places. There were fights between the shepherds and the herdsmen because they were trying to control their flock. And of course, sheep are crazy animals. So if they had sheep, they were probably button heads and fighting with one another. And your sheep's hurting my sheep. Get your sheep away from my sheep, right? That kind of a thing going on. And tattletaling and everything like that. And of course, if your employees are battling with your nephew's employees, there's going to be some issue, right? Between those two. Because you're trying to, to organize, you're trying to, to have all these things. And so what happens is, is that they were starting to have these issues. They were, they were starting to, to have these. And so in Genesis chapter 13, you will, you will read about uh, Abram and Lot actually separating. Um, Abram settled in the land of Canaan, which happens to be the land that God promised to Abram and his descendants. Uh, Lot settled in Sodom, the, the Sodom that we know of as Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, and the, the people that lived there, the Bible says, were wicked people. They were people that were, were uh, they weren't honorable, honorable people. They, they did as their heart pleased. Um, and they had no regard for, uh, for God or for a way of life that was civil, I guess you could say. And so Abram and Lot, they settled. They live in. And in and, and, and this time, I'm giving you the backstory now of where we're going. There were, there were four kings that had formed an alliance with each other, and they forced other uh, city-states. We, the Bible calls them nations, but at this time, remember that there wasn't like communication like we have today. You had like walls and old style fortresses and, and, and castles and all that other kind of stuff. So we're not quite in the medieval age, but um, they were city-states. So your king was like the mayor of the city. So you had four kings, four cities that rose up against four or five cities and they submitted, they subdued them. And, and in order to keep peace, they would have to pay them a share of cash, pay them a share of their food, pay them a share of everything. So they taxed them in order to keep peace, in order to keep things. And I'm sure that there was some sort of contract going on and, and all that happens. So eventually they had enough. These five cities had enough. And so the king of Sodom, they, uh, he and, and four other kings, they started to rebel against these four kings. Okay, All the names are in there, but if you want to try to pronounce them with me, we'll do that later. Um, so... They had been against, they, they rose up against them. A rebellion started. And guess what? The five kings that rose up in rebellion, they lost the battle. They lost. And so in Genesis 14.10, we, we read that the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, they actually fled. They ran away. They surrendered. They were just like, I'm out of here. We're done. And there were, there were, there were pit tar, uh, tar pits, <laughs> um, that, that, were, that were out there. And, and it actually says that some of the men that were fleeing from battle because their kings had run off, they fell into the tar pits. And like that would be a terrible way to go, wouldn't it? Because that's like, that's like asphalt, like naturally forming asphalt. It's hot. It's not good. It's sticky. You're stuck once you get in there, right? Have you ever stepped on wet asphalt before? Or like the rubbery stuff that they put down? You, you stick to that junk, right? So... They fell into these things. It's kind of a weird, uh, trying to picture the situation. So, so what happens when, especially in this time, when kings defeat other kings? What happens to the cities that are defeated? They're demolished sometimes. They're plundered. They're, they get stolen from. People sometimes get kidnapped. And that's actually what happened in this situation. Um, the enemy takes all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and kidnaps some people, including Abram's nephew, Lot. So we pick up in verse 13. Then the one who had, es- who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre and the Amorite, the brother of Eshcol and of Aner. And these were allies of Abram. So this battle takes place. Abram is not involved. He is outside looking in. He, he doesn't even possibly know that this is going on. He didn't have CNN or, or Fox News or, or MSNBC to let them know that war is broken out. And, blah, you know, and they, they do all their crazy spinning of it all. And somebody escapes from these kings and comes up to Abram and says, Abram, there's been a war and your nephew has been taken captive. He's been all of his stuff, all of his family. They've been carried back with these four kings. And so this is definitely a situation that is beyond Abram's control, right? 
He has no influence in this at this point. This has already happened. And, and you have to think about it. You have to try to put yourself in his position because sometimes we don't think of the people in the Bible as real people. We just look at them as like fable, fairy tale people. But put yourself in his position. It's not unlike that of 9 11. Right? Somebody has come into your homeland. Somebody has come into at least your nephew's homeland, has attacked, has destroyed the armies. The kings have fled, and now they have taken prisoners and they're carrying them back. What are you going to do? Are you just going to sit there and cry and cover your head and lay down with your hair over your face and just, just be like, oh, right? Think about the emotions. Understand what, what might be feeling, what goes through your mind. Let's just put ourselves in a situation that becomes extremely personal. Your brother or sister's child has been kidnapped. Not by an army, not by anybody, but just picked off in the middle of the city and now we don't know where they are. How is that going to make you feel? Stressed. What else? How are you going to react? You're going to go out and look. You're going to do something about it. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to get up. You're going to worry. You're going to call the police. You're going to call your friends. You're going to call your friends in the city, right? Because they probably got some resources, right? You're going to call people that you know that can do something about it. You're going to change. Your concern for justice goes through the roof, right? Just goes through the roof. Thoughts about what could possibly happen to them start to roam in your mind. Start to be concerned about these things. Anger, sadness, confusion. Other emotions are going to flood your mind. And you start to feel this, this compulsion to do something about it. That is stress. It's a, it's a good form of stress, I would say. It's a, it's, a, it's a form of stress that probably comes out of the, the, the compassionate side of us. But it's also a form of stress that can lead us down paths that are not so holy. It's a situation that's going to dominate your mind, though. You're, you're not going to think about it for just 10, 15 minutes and go, oh, that's just terrible, and go bake some cookies, right? Not going to happen. That is not going to happen. You are going to drop everything and you are going to move. But here's the thing, is that you and I, we don't like stress, do we? Shake your head no, because we don't like stress, okay? You be with me today, please. You don't like stress. Do you enjoy stress? Okay. I was going to say, because i got a whole bucket of stress I can give to you that I'm not really fond of right now. Stress... You like cookies. I love that. That's awesome. We'll bake some cookies together. Um, you are going to drop everything and move in this situation, but we don't like stress. So when things don't go according to our plan, what is that? That's stressful, isn't it? Because you had it all planned out in your mind. You had it all figured out how it was all going to work. You had it all figured out about, about this situation is going to go here and this was going to go this way and, and it was going to be all better. I had it in my mind that on September 7th we were going to close on this building and we were going to be working there 24-7 for the last four days. Now I'm glad that didn't happen. I had some other things I needed to take care of and I also got to spend a couple of nights with my wife that were, that were precious. And, uh, and, but I had a plan. And now I'm mad that, that plan didn't work out. Now I'm, now I'm left in unknown land, right? You with me, Ken? Yeah, Ken's with me. All right. You're just, you're just stuck. It gets our back up a bit. Because when things don't go according to our plan, that's offensive, isn't it? We find that offensive. How dare you change my plans? How dare you tell me what to do? Oh, Right? How many of us have said that before? You can't tell me what to do. I live my life. This is my body. This is my life. Don't you dare tell me what happens with it. <laughs> okay? Go ahead. But anyone that I've watched live in that capacity has caused far more stress for themselves. Every time I live in that way myself, I cause so much more stress in my life than if I just sit back, be humble, and play a little ball. Isn't that interesting? We start questioning 
What in the world is going on when things don't go according to our plan? Don't you, don't, don't you think you'd question God, especially in this situation, if your niece or nephew were kidnapped? Don't you think you would ask God, why did you allow this to happen? Why on earth did you allow this to happen? You're God. You are supposedly sovereign. You could have stopped this, but you didn't. You let them take him. You let them take her. You let them get sick. Oh. If you're not causing it to happen, God, you're allowing it to happen. And our nature is to rebel against this stress. Our nature is to say, I don't like this. I'm not going to sit in it. I'm going to do everything I possibly can to fight against it. And all of our reasons have this undertone in them. Why are you making me endure this stress? Why are you making me endure this pain? Why are you making me sit in this situation that I don't understand and that I cannot control? And I call this a freak out moment. How many of you have ever had a freak out moment? Yeah, I have. A couple of times this week. Uh, <laughs> okay? It's a freak out moment that we forget everything that we believe, every principle and value that we supposedly claim to live by, and we just simply react. Right? Words start flying out of your mouth that you wouldn't normally use. <laughs> I didn't expect that that quick. <laughs> Words start just, right? A hand gets raised, right? We get mad enough. Ugh! I just want to change this. I want to act out. We forget, Christians, you forget to rely on Scripture. I do too. We forget to rely on those things. We forget to be a mature person. And we just freak out. And I think in, in some ways, I mean, short of sin, I think that this is okay as long as we don't do anything permanent, right? I think that, that we're some days, especially if we're in our own home and probably most times away from our family, it's okay to get a pillow out and destroy it. It's okay to, 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 to break things sometimes. Would you agree with me? No, <laughs> uh, I think it's okay. I think that I don't see anything in Scripture that doesn't allow us to, to, to expel this in some way as long as we're not destroying uh, something that is living. All right, that, that is where I draw the line. As soon as you begin to injure uh, somebody or something else that is alive, that's, that's over. But if I want to take a lamp and break it because I am that angry, I'm going to get a baseball bat and, you know, and just take out some stress. <laughs> you can disagree with me on that. If you, want to look, if you want to show me a scripture where that's a sin, that's fine. But I think that, that there are some things. When you see people in the Bible ripping their clothes off of themselves because they're so angry, I think that that's the same, same situation that's going on. And so um, we need to, we, I think it's okay as long as we don't do anything permanent. I think it's okay. But we need to look around and get perspective of what is and what could be happening, right? In the moments that we don't understand what's going on, faith demands that we look to the heavens and say, I'll still follow you wherever you lead me and I will give you glory. That's what faith demands. I want to say that again. In the moments that we don't understand what's going on, faith demands that we look to the heavens and say, I'll still follow you wherever you lead me because I will give you glory. If you're not a Christian, if you don't believe in Jesus, that doesn't necessarily apply to you. But you claim to have faith in the risen Lord Jesus Christ? I believe faith demands this of you. Your beliefs, your belief in the Gospel demands that you, in a situation that you don't understand, you look up and you go, God, I don't understand this. I don't like this. I am mad about this. But I am going to do everything I possibly can within my own ability to praise you, to give you honor, and to give you glory. Because my life exists to glorify you. God's glory 
is our primary objective. God's glory is our primary objective. It's all of creation's primary objective. Did you know that in, in I, I believe it's in Psalms, that it says that when, when sin entered the world, creation was cursed. The trees were cursed. The rivers were cursed. That's why we read in the Psalms that the trees of the field are going to clap their, or that's Isaiah, the trees of the field are going to clap their hands. It says in Psalms that the rivers are going to clap with joy. They're going to worship God. When, when Jesus comes back and when things take over in, in after judgment, creation is going to be released from the sin and the curse that we've brought upon it. Isn't that kind of cool? You're all looking at me like, show me that in the Scripture. I will. Not today. <laughs> but it's awesome. And so... God's glory is our primary objective. It's all of creation's primary objective. I didn't put these in my notes because I wanted to read them straight from the Bible, but, um, and I don't even have them up here, but here's some things talking about God's sovereignty, God's uh, uh, ability, power, His, His glory, everything that, that He is dominant in our lives, even though we want full control of them. Psalm uh, 135, verse 6 says, Whatever the Lord pleases, He does, in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the in all deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes uh, lightnings for rain for the rain, and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. He does whatever he pleases. Psalm 115. Uh, verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens, he does all that he pleases. And then if you flip over to New Testament, just to give you one that's, 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 that is current, Romans 9, uh, Paul is talking about God's sovereign ability to do whatever He wants. And he, and he says, you will say to me then, why does He still find fault? For who can resist His will? But who are you? Listen, who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Oh, that's weighty, isn't it? God formed us. He made us. He made you. He didn't make you corrupt. He didn't make you wicked. But He is the molder. You are the molded. He is the potter. You are the clay. I don't know why He's made your body the way that He's made it. I don't know why He's given you the, the, the demeanor that He's given to you. I don't know why He put you in Lapeer County, Michigan. I don't know why He's given you the family that He's given to you. I don't know why the molder has molded you the way that He has molded you. But I do know this, is that you have no right to question why He did it. Let me rephrase that. You have no right to know why He did what He did today. You have every right to question Him. I question God all the time. You should see my journal over the last two weeks. Why is it this way? God, why are you doing this this way? What is, give me answers for crying out loud. And sometimes He chooses to not give me an answer. Because I am the molded. He is the molder. You can get your back up about that. You can reject Him because He's not respecting you and your rights. But let me tell you something. Before the United States of America was ever invented, you didn't have much rights. Unless you had money. And so if we submit ourselves to be a part of this chorus of worship along with creation, if, if we live our entire lives, even if we don't like what's going on, God's promises will abound and no less the promise of eternal life. Do you understand that? It's the same thing I was talking about earlier. You listen to your employer. You do what he says. You're going to get a paycheck. You might even get a promotion, right? You might even get more money. You might even get more responsibility. You might get more to do more of what you actually enjoy. 
Salvation is not dependent upon how you necessarily act. It's based upon repentance and in your response to God's love. But His blessings absolutely depend on how we perceive Him and how we choose to live our lives. And so, we work through this. There is a life beyond this one. A life beyond stress. A life in the presence of God with no more fear, no more hunger, no more pain, no more suffering. And a new body that doesn't gain weight. (gasps) Oh my goodness! Right? All the Pepsi and Oreos for everyone, right? (sighs) Fine, you can have Coke. But, think about that. God's promised a physical resurrection. It doesn't mean we disregard this garment that we're currently in right now. But He's promised a physical resurrection. You will have a new body. It's going to be studly. (laughs) Well, ladies, it's not going to be studly for you. Hopefully not. Yeah, You guys will, you know, drop dead gorgeous. How about that? Sound good to you? Okay. Um, there's going to be a new body. There's going to be a new attitude. There's going to be a new lease on life because it's going to be a glorified body. It's going to be a glorified life. It's going to be a life with God. So it's a body that doesn't gain weight. It's a new body that doesn't get sick. No more cancer. No more Alzheimer's. No more ALS. No more Lou Gehrig's. No more uh, celiac disease. You can eat all the gluten you want, right? Enjoy the pizza. Enjoy everything that is there, right? It's done. It's over. It's over. A new body that is glorified and not marred by the sinfulness of this present body. And so we need to get perspective of what's going on and fall back on faith. We need to understand that even though I don't like this, this life isn't about whether or not I like it. And I, don't have, and I don't have control over it. But I need to see this situation through. Usually a stressful situation requires action. Usually a stressful situation, it's a lot like grief. There is no possible way around grief. You have to go through it. Stress is exactly the same way. The more you avoid it, the more you push it down, the more it causes issues in your life. Okay? So, Abram did this. He got perspective. He took a moment, evaluated what was going on. Uh, God had already given him snippets of what was happening. We, we talked about that last week where, where he, he got up and he left and God said, all right, you got up and you left. This is the land that I'm going to give to you. And he started revealing parts of his plan. And that's a beautiful place to be in when you begin to see that you are walking in step with God and it's comforting and it's awesome and it gives you confidence. And that's where Abram's confidence comes from for his next step because he had already seen God's promises begin to take shape. So Abram had this already and, and he had already gotten part of the promise. He'd already had more of the plan revealed to him. And he hears that Lot's been kidnapped and had everything taken. And so in verse 14, when Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them. Love that number. And went in pursuit as far as Dan. Abram the first thing he does is he gets perspective of what's going on. He understands it, he sees it, and then he jumps into action. He gets moving. He heard it, his kinsmen had been taken captive, and he led forth his trained men. I think that's awesome. Here's why. He jumps into action. He responds, he doesn't react. Right? He doesn't doesn't react. How many of you realize that every time you react to something rather than respond, it's a bad thing? It's a very bad thing, okay? We don't have any, any indication that this is impulsive. Remember in the days after 9-11, how many people wanted to declare war on the Middle East? How many people were talking about, we got nukes, let's drop them, right? People that don't really realize the magnitude of what was happening. How was the, res- how was the, how the response was, wasn't really calculated, but it was just to kind of get them back? You remember feeling that? I remember feeling that way. How dare they do that to us? We're stronger than them. We're bigger than them. Let's go take care of them right now. You know what I mean? That was a reaction, not a 
response. Because now that we're 15 years past, we see what the reaction has really done, right? You guys have seen that in the news and read about it in the paper and different things like that. Reactions aren't always the best thing. We don't have a reaction here, though. We have a response. We don't see Abram vengeful. His aim wasn't to conquer the kings and claim their land. He had already been promised a land by God. And what we have is a rescue mission. A couple of things that I want to point out here. Abram had trained men. He had trained men. You think about this. Obviously, uh, this requ- uh, Abram in this time, it required Abram um, to, to have guards and security and a police force and all that kind of stuff, right? Because he was rich. He had silver, gold, livestock. People could come in at night and steal anything he had, right? So he had to have trained men ready to fight. So trained guards or armies were necessary in this time period, but, but they were trained well enough that they could respond immediately. They're like, they're like minute men of the militia. They're ready to go. Boom. It wasn't like they were, they were going to fashion spears and weaponry out of nothing. Once Abraham realized there was an issue, he made the call and they came together and they started pursuing the enemy that had Lot. Abraham was also leading by faith. Because think about this. Think about the thing, think about something the last time that something caught you by surprise. A situation that you couldn't control. Think about that for a minute. It could have been something silly. It could have been that you expected somebody to do the dishes before you got home and they didn't do them. And that was infuriating to you. Think about a time when, you, mom said earlier, um, maybe you walked into work and your job wasn't there anymore. Think about a time that you didn't get paid for the work that you did. Think about a time that a friend, excuse me, gossiped about you behind your back, caught you off guard and it caused problems for you. Think about a time when something caught you off guard. You may have not been prepared for those exact set of circumstances. Usually we're not. But what is so useful in those moments is God's Word. If you are a student of God's Word and you are a man or woman who is living a life listening to God's Spirit, immediately God's promises begin to come to mind. Probably the best illustration of this is the Apostle Paul writing into the church in Philippi, saying, I have learned in whatever situation I am in, we're going to skip a couple of words, the last words in here, is that I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. How many of you could confidently say that today? Whatever situation you are in, that you could be content. The times when when you know when you're brought low, facing plenty, facing hunger, facing abundance, facing need. Man, there's there's nothing that drives some people than an empty stomach, isn't there? Dominates your mind. I don't have enough money to feed me, my kids, my family, my neighbors. And it drives you. And it drives you. If you know this scripture, though, if you've studied and memorized these words, then when an unpleasant situation comes up, this scripture can come to mind. That it's possible to be content and to glorify God in every situation because it's Him who will give me the strength. Why? Because this is a part of God's plan to bring glory unto Himself. I am the molded. He is the molder. And this is an opportunity for me to put it on display. This is an opportunity for me to put faith on display. This is an opportunity for me to put God's glory on display. Because why? Because in my weakness, what? He is made strong, right? You can talk. It's okay. You know that verse. I know you know that verse. All right? In my weakness, He is made strong. There we go. That's perfect. So we see this. We keep going. So our response is if we, if we rest and meditate on God's promises is one of faith and it's immediate. It's immediate. We don't have to go to our internet browser and be like, okay, I'm facing this issue, so I need to find verses on strength. 
And then you find a bunch of things in the Old Testament, you're like, that does not help me. Right? Have you ever happened that to you? So, okay, well, maybe I'll just open this up and I'll, and I'll point. A bear mauls teenagers coming out of the woods. Okay, that doesn't work for me either, right? And we get discouraged and we're just like, nah, because it's in those moments that we're not trained. We're not ready for battle. We're not ready for the things that are going to take us by surprise. The Spirit brings it to mind, and even though we can't control the situation, we can, we can respond in faith based upon God's truth and God's promises. And so Abram's kept perspective. He has acted immediately in faith, mobilizing 318 men from his household, made up of servants in his household, to go and get Lot and his possessions back. And so we read in verses 15 and 16, he says, And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. Abram took 318 men from his own household. Now, these were probably servants, slaves. These were probably people, they were, in his household means they were born in his household. So these are people that, that, that are close to him, not necessarily family, but people that, that worked for him, that worked with him, that knew him. They went up the forces, up against the forces, that just wiped out five other city-states. You realize that? 318 men, probably a formidable fighting size for these, these types of cities. But there was an alliance of four of them that has been subduing other cities for time. These guys are absolutely trained for battle. These guys are absolutely organized. These ones are absolutely powerful. And they took off. We don't know how many men they had. But we know that it was enough to steamroll the other armies to the point where the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah were running away. 318 men who were trained in the art of policing, protecting the possessions that Abram had, not battle-hardened. And it says that Abram's force defeated the forces that kidnapped Lot and took all the possessions back. And we hear nothing of losses on either side, but I would say it's safe to assume that he lost few men, if any. Because it doesn't mention it. What gave Abram the confidence to do this? Think about this. He wasn't involved in the initial attack. He had, he had nobody, nobody else other than the lot was taken captive. He's just hearing about this. It would strike fear into the average man, but a Abram wasn't average. Abram was a man who was called by God, and Abram had a promise from God. Abram was told that he was going to be made into a great nation. Abram was told that his name would be made great, made great and be a blessing. And Abram was told that whoever dishonored him would be cursed. They would be cursed. And so what did Abram have to fear? What did he have to fear? An army of an unknown size, unknown training, and unknown location. But armed with the promises of God, armed with His blessing, He ran into the center of the conflict, not to be rich, not for vengeance, but for the salvation of His own family. Don't miss this. Abram depended on God every step of the way. Otherwise, fear would have driven him to just count his losses and go on with his life. The best question you can ask when you're in a situation that you can't control is this question. What can I control in this situation? Most often than not, what's your response to that question? Think about it for a second. You can control your response. When you cannot control the circumstances that surround you, what you can control is your response. Okay? And so we look at this and we understand if you think of a situation that you're in, maybe it deals with your family and your actions. You can't control those things. If, if, and if you try to control them, it will just make things worse. Maybe your situation is financial in nature. You can't find a job. You can't stop things from breaking. You can't stop the government from, from taking. You, you, you can't stop the collectors from calling. 
Or maybe your situation is internal. You're, you're facing uncontrollable anxiety attacks. You're, you're looking depression in the eyes. You're hearing the voices of discouragement and discontent. Here's how do we deal with it. If we get perspective. If you can't get the facts, then find the facts. Don't let emotions dictate what is true and what is not true. Because I'm telling you something. This is a truth you can take to the bank. Emotions lie to you. Listen to me. Emotions lie to you. I'm not, trying to, I'm not going to tell you that your emotions are, are invalidated for any w- reason whatsoever. If you're sad, if you're mad, if you're, if you're upset, if you're afraid, admit it. Deal with it. Understand it. But there is a great chance that your emotions are lying to you at any given point. I know that when I get discouraged about things in my job, things in my family, I have to talk to somebody else who will tell me the facts. Who will tell me what is really going on because in the middle of it, I can't see what's going on. Find someone you trust who will tell you like it is and let them be your GPS in the fog of those emotions. But more importantly than even that, find ways to drive your circumstances straight into God's promises. Find ways to drive your circumstances into God's promises. Because if you're immersed in the things that God says, you'll, your freak out moment isn't going to last that long. And the promises of God will move you from worry into worship and then from worship into war. Do you understand that? Go from worry to worship. Because God loves you. We are going to honor that God. We're going to sing with all creation. And then as a result of that worship, as a result of being instilled with God's promises, we're going to move into war. We're going to take care of what we can take care of. And once you have, so once you have perspective, we're going to respond. These circumstances that you can't control, they're like the four kings who ransacked Sodom and Gomorrah. And they're going to ransack your safety and security from time to time. An anxiety attack is going to keep you from going somewhere. Depression is going to try and chain you to your bed and to its darkness. A lack of money is going to increase your desire for more of it. People are going to frustrate you and create problems for you. If you get perspective and you know that every single situation you can't control is an opportunity for your faith to carry you through it. And you need to call up God's promises. You need to call up this army from within. And the truths that carry with them the authority of God's unlimited power and start marching straight into your circumstances. This is your army. The question is whether or not it's trained. Are God's promises in your mind trained and ready for any surprise attack? Or when things come and knock on your door, are you going to run? Because you have no foundation to stand upon. So once you start walking, make sure that every step is done with direction. Make every step from God's word and for all of God's glory. It doesn't matter whether or not you come out on the other side richer or poorer or ahead or behind. What matters is that God's power is displayed and that you see that God has carried you through. Listen to me. It's important. I know that that some of you are facing huge financial stresses. I know that some of you are facing huge family stresses. I know that some of you are facing huge internal stresses. And you are stressed out beyond anything that you actually even understand. Your mind is devoting so many resources to try and control circumstances that you can't control. But here's what you can control is whether or not your life worships the God in heaven. Whether or not your life is a light to all mankind or it can be a terrible report. You can walk around and go, oh. I heard somebody, we went to Walmart last night. We were checking out. The guy behind us came up. The cashier asked him, how are you doing? Terrible. And I thought, one, I'm like, what's so terrible about your life? Your cart's pretty full. You know, you got clothes on your back. But I realize that sometimes people live for things that are more It's sad. Because as Christians, 
we should live differently. We should know how to live when we have plenty and when we have little. We should know how to live rightly when we are able to stuff our faces and when we're going hungry. We should know how to live when our car gets in a wreck and we can't drive it anymore or when we've got a brand new Mercedes sitting in our parking lot, right? We should know how to live regardless. We should be steady. We should be just. We should be compassionate. We should be gentle. We should be patient with people. But sometimes we let our pursuit of this world get in our way. We let these ideas that we live by in this country called rights. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But it clouds our vision of what God has intended us to live. And that is laying down those rights so that the other people can see the light and the love and the power and the majesty and the glory of our great God. Can I tell you that when the religious right stands up and says, no, I want mine, you are demonstrating to the world something that is wrong. Jesus laid His life down for you and for me. Shouldn't we do the same for others? Shouldn't we react to our circumstances not in a way that is a haughty and incompassionate? Shouldn't we look at the person that's behind us in Walmart and go, man, I'm so sorry your life is terrible. What can I do to help you? He was actually making a comment. The cashier asked where the divide in our groceries were. He said, you can put them on, your, on their bill. As we were walking out, I'm like, man, I should have done that after he said his, he was terrible. Because I could have gone back and said, you don't have anything to feel terrible about. Live in the light. Don't let your circumstances that are beyond your control stress you out. Don't let it happen. I know that's easier said than done. I know because I, go, I do it from time to time. Any given day you stop in in the office and you ask me how I'm doing, I'm going to tell you probably one of two things. Great or busy. Right? See the stress in your life as an opportunity to call on the promises of God, to display the mighty power of our God to all who are watching. Imagine if your worship in today's hardship turned out to be the display that God wanted to show your friends, your co-workers, your family, the very reason they should explore the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. 